Thank you very much for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, my name is Dr. Ted Broman. I'm the Senior Research Fellow in Anglo-American Relations in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom here at Heritage. I'd like to welcome the audience in the room, and I'd like especially to welcome our online audience. I'd like to remind them that this program will be posted within about 24 hours for their and your future viewing and use. Also like to remind you that in the audience here, we will have time for Q&A after our speaker finishes his remarks. For our audience online, uh, you can ask questions if you're interested in doing so by emailing speaker at heritage.org at any time. Those questions will be passed up to the podium and to the speaker here. Uh, after Britain voted for, to leave the European Union in June of 2016, one of the prevailing themes in commentary on the Brexit vote was that this meant a fundamental change in Britain's defense relationship, curiously, with NATO. The argument was made repeatedly and publicly that the British vote to leave the European Union implied a fundamental change of its relationship with NATO, of which Britain was the founding and, with the sole exception of the United States, the single most important member. Uh, this was, of course, a lie. Uh, the vote for Brexit had no relationship whatsoever to Britain's membership of NATO, which has remained entirely unaltered, and if, pre if current government policy is anything to go by, will continue to remain entirely unaltered. I cannot, of course, speak for what Mr. Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party might do if they are elected to uh, lead the British government, but at least this government and any future conservative government, and for that matter, many future Labour governments, because all NATO was, of course, a labor creation. Uh, the British policy towards NATO is going to remain unchanged. But that does not mean that there are no implications whatsoever between Brexit and the US-UK defense relationship, which is the subject our speaker will be discussing today. I'm very honored uh, to have with me on the podium here Professor Gwythian Prince, who is an emeritus research professor at the London School of Economics, having retired in 2013, although he does not seem to be the retiring sort. He is also the visiting senior academic fellow at the French Military Academy, Saint-Cyr. He joined LSE in 2000, successively as professorial research fellow, and then revived geopolitical research at LSE as the founding director of the Mackinder Center, named for a personal hero of mine, Sir Halford Mackinder, the school's second director. Sir Halford was, I think it's fair to say, the inventor of, geopol of geopolitics. Uh, and the author of a, one enormously influential article, which came out about 115 or so years ago. Uh, then, uh, from 2002 to 2007, uh, Professor Prince took his first stint as the first Alliance Research Professor jointly at LSE and at Columbia University in New York. For over 20 years previously, he was Fellow, Tutor, and Director of Studies in History at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Uh, he's held a number of other government roles and academic positions over the years. He is currently a member of the Chief of Desta Defense Staff Strategy Advisory Panel and of the Royal Marines Advisory Group, and is an honorary member of both the Royal Navy Special Boat Service and of the Army Intelligence Corps. He also serves on the board of the Charity Commission of England and Wales, which helps to regulate approximately 140,000 charities in England and Wales. So that in itself seems enough to keep him busy, but not to be deterred, he's here to speak to us today on Brexit and the US-UK defense relationship. Professor Prince. Thank you very much, Ted. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen in the room, ladies and gentlemen on far away on the screen. I'm very honored and grateful for the hospitality of your platform here this afternoon uh, so that I can share with you some insights into the least well-discussed and yet in many ways the most dangerous aspect uh, of the strategies by which Mrs. May and her close advisors have failed to execute the instruction that I and 17.4 million other people gave to our government in June of 2016 to leave the fast collapsing European Union. These relate to national security and hence inevitably and indissolubly to the special relationship between this country and my country, which lies at the heart of the Anglosphere alliances, notably the Five Eyes 
Intelligence Alliance. So the systematic compromising of UK national security that is hidden within the so-called withdrawal agreement, for it is, in practical effect, the Orwellian opposite. It is an instrument that would keep the United Kingdom under EU control as a powerless supplicant and rule taker, is a real and present threat to US national security also. Ladies and gentlemen, your story is our story. Our enemies are, by and large, your enemies too. And as before, in times of roiling European crisis, we urgently need your help. We are indeed living in interesting times in the United Kingdom in just the dual sense that the Chinese sage warned. We have learned in an unprecedented leak last week uh, that on the 23rd of April, the British National Security Council considered whether or not to allow Huawei, the Chinese telecom company which Mr. Jeremy Hunt, our foreign secretary, has reminded us has a legal duty to cooperate with the Chinese state intelligence services into the development of British 5G networks. It is reported in the leaks uh, from the NSC that the Secretaries of State for Defense, Foreign and Home Affairs, International Trade and International Development all opposed such involvement. And that, of course, is the settled view of this country and of Australia too. Yet against the advice of the majority of her ministers, the Prime Minister, Mrs. May, is apparently minded to allow it. Now, this is not the first time that she has acted thus, being guided by a tiny cell of advisors and ignoring wider advice, including the rejection of her withdrawal agreement draft in the House of Commons three times so far and by historic majorities. And it is one of the reasons for the effective collapse of cabinet discipline and secrecy in Mrs. May's profoundly dysfunctional government. The chairman of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee observed of this leaked information that, and I quote him, this is not simply a technical issue, but a diplomatic one, undermining the trust that has built the 70-year relationship we know as the Five Eyes community, which keeps threats away from our shores and ensures the security of our citizens around the world. Sir Richard Dearlove, the former chief of the Secret Intelligence Service, and my close colleague in research and warning on the security threats within the May strategy towards the European Union, to which I shall shortly turn, stated that, and I quote Richard, this is an appalling decision. It is a risk to five eyes. There is no question about that. There is a security risk. There is no question about that. The problem is that if the Chinese know so much about our systems, it's not only that they may be able to use trapdoors in crisis, it also makes it much easier to do routine intercepts. Now, I begin with the Huawei issue because really, for the first time in a long time, it has surfaced intelligence and security questions into the mainstream public discussion. But also because it highlights a systematic difference between the Anglosphere, the Anglosphere world of the Five Eyes and continental Europe. Governments there, notably Germany, do not see Huawei as a loaded gun, as Rob Joyce, the senior cyber security expert at the American NSA, graphically described it. So why would serving British officials take the continental rather than the Anglosphere view, especially when the British people had firmly voted for the open seas over an entangling continental commitment? Well, it might be for the same reason that in 1519, having landed on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, Stout Cortes burned his boats so that his soldiers had no way back to Cuba. In our case, the overwhelming majority of Whitehall and Westminster, that is of officials and of members of both houses of parliament, have not, not for one second, accepted the result of the largest democratic mandate in British history. Instead, 
assisted by a campaign in the country led by Lords Malloch Brown and Mandelson, along with the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and well-funded by Mr. George Soros, they have striven to subvert it by engaging in an entirely unnecessary and mind-bogglingly complicated negotiation about a deal that will deliver a Hotel California Brexit in name only. And you'll recall the Eagles lyric, I'm sure. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. The more principled Romaniac MPs in the House of Commons have comforted themselves in their actions with a misreading of Edmund Burke's address to the electors of Bristol, where the famous admonition to use their best judgment has been invoked as reason to defy the referendum instruction, which, by the way, is not advisory. It is mandatory, as Mr. Cameron, of blessed memory, explained in 2016. So if your crew is mutinous, best burn the boats. That would certainly be the practical effect, were it to be passed, of the thrice-rejected withdrawal agreement and its associated political declaration if and when Mrs. May brings it back to Parliament for a fourth time, which seems to be her only strategy. And public actions distancing the United Kingdom from its natural and most loyal allies can be interpreted as tokens of adherence, of supplication even, to the European project to give Mrs. May sufficient concessions to enable her to bulldoze her toxic withdrawal agreement through Parliament with the active assistance of the most partisan speaker of the House of Commons since the 17th century. <coughs> Sir Richard and I, with others, including my military colleagues in Veterans for Britain, certainly see the surrenders of UK sovereign control over the prime function of the state, which is the defense of the realm, in this way. And nor, ladies and gentlemen, are these mere opinions. They are issues of documented fact, as I will shortly rehearse. I mentioned that Mrs. May relies on a tiny cell of advisors, the May cell, over all other constitutionally emplaced bodies, such as her cabinet. Her cabinet was brutally subverted when the so-called Chequers Plan was imposed on it on the 6th of July, 2018. And that caused the resignation of Boris Johnson from the Foreign Office and of ministers from the Department for Exiting the European Union who had been blindsided. And it was all to no avail in any case because the EU, the EU rejected her plan that September. But we do need to give names to this powerful cell. There is the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and in-house fixer, a failed MP called Gavin Barwell. There is her National Security Advisor, who is simultaneously, rather peculiarly, her Cabinet Secretary, Sir Mark Sedwill. There is her Europe Advisor, Oliver Robbins, and his Defence Advisor, Alistair Brockbank. Her Political Secretary, Stephen Parkinson, and her husband, Philip. And then there are two important civil servants, both with experience in senior EU-facing or serving posts. There is Angus Lapsley, a diplomat who has found a considerable role in defense. And then there is Dr. Brian Wells, who is the Director of Science and Technology at the Ministry of Defense. Several of these people have been with Mrs. May for a long time, personally her husband, of course, and professionally in her previous post at the Home Office, where she was a long-serving minister. And then, finally, there are two key Romaniac ministers, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who has blocked key no-deal preparations, and junior Foreign Office Minister Sir Alan Duncan, who, on the 19th of November 2018, helped the EU to lock in eight major power grabs for the military EU five days after Mrs. May had announced agreement with the EU to her Carthaginian withdrawal agreement. Lapsley is on record when he was the UK ambassador to the EU's political and security committee, telling his fellow ambassadors that he did not understand why his country had voted to leave the European Union. Ich verstehe nicht, is actually what he said. Bizarrely, he declared in the same remarks that EU foreign policy had always been I quote, relatively popular 
in the UK, and that, quote, we rather like the security strategy. We rather like the global strategy. We are part of the member states who helped shape it. We think it's a good strategy. The we in this, I think, is clearly first person singular. Lapsley has tweeted that, I quote, the EU Commission is needed if we are to respond to modern threats in Europe. Wells, for his part, has actually worked for the European Defense Agency and has repeatedly encouraged British defense companies to engage in the drive towards EU defense union. So both of these men show the signs of strong EU institutional capture. The EU has harbored an ambition to create a defense union independent of the United States since its very inception, something to which Ted averred in his introduction, and logically so. A true federal union requires the key attributes of sovereign power, armed forces, a currency, a judiciary, a parliament. But the Pleven Plan of 1950 failed, as did the Defense Community of 1954, which British Foreign Secretary Sir Anthony Eden guided into the face-saving formula of the Western European Union, for which, by the way, he got no thanks. However, as soon as the UK voted to leave the EU, the Commission initiated the rapid takeoff of a flying defense union, and Federica Mogherini, the ersatz union foreign minister, has correctly said that more has been done in this regard since November 2016 than in any of the previous 60 years. Two afterburners were lit off that month. The Implementation Plan on Security and Defense, the SDIP, on the 14th, and the European Defense Action Plan, the EDAP, on the 30th of November 2016. And these two documents tie all emerging EU defense capabilities to the overriding federal goal of EU ever closer union and to the EU's foreign policy objectives, many of which run contrary to the national interests of the United Kingdom. The first of the two, the SDIP, is part of the foreign policy uh, global strategy that Mr. Lapsley likes so very much. And the other, Defense Action Plan, states the EU's ambitions. The SDIP is the working plan to use EU finances and assets delivered by the EDAP. Worryingly, Sir Alan Duncan, who is in the May cell, has stated that the United Kingdom, quote, agreed with much of the contents of SDIP. I think more first person singular under a false flag, or possibly it's the voice of the May cell. Initiatives came thick and fast. And an acronym storm of new agencies and initiatives were waved through half a dozen successive European councils. The United Kingdom objected to none of these. And why should we? We were leaving, and it was not our business to obstruct the future plans of the remaining members. In his State of the Union speech of the 27th of September 2017, President Juncker had opined that, quote, by 2025, we need a fully-fledged European Defense Union. And in case the geostrategic orientation of this project was obscure, in a semiotically freighted interview on local radio on Armistice Day 2019, President Macron clarified it while visiting France's most memory-laden site, Verdun, the birthplace of the dreams of European Federal Union a century before. Europe, Macron stated in that interview, needed organic and independent federal defense to protect it against threats, whether from China, Russia, or the United States. Go figure, as you say so economically over here. In early 2017, in Britain, the course ahead for Brexit seemed to be well and safely charted. The Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech of the 17th was refreshingly plain in stating that, and I quote, we do not seek partial membership of the European Union, associate membership of the European Union, or anything that leaves us half in or half out. We do not seek to hold on to bits of membership as we leave, no. The, Europe, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union, and my job is to get the right deal for Britain as we do so. I am equally clear, she concluded, 
that no deal for Britain is better than a bad deal for Britain, which it certainly is. It is a correct and good speech. And now it seems so long ago. Mrs. May's policy in 2019 is Lancaster House stood on its head. Did she believe a word of it then? Who knows? But what we do know is that in June 2017, after a disastrous campaign which exposed her flaws mercilessly, Mrs. May lost her majority in a general election, which should have given a charismatic and wholeheartedly Brexiteer conservative leader a comfortable working majority. The strategy towards the EU changed fundamentally, and threats to national security suddenly began to appear. The first crow flapped into sight in September of 2017. The Department for Exiting the European Union issued an alarming paper. The future partnership paper wished to offer and to obtain what it said on the cover, partnership. Now, this may be good-hearted, but it is utterly naive betraying an ignorance of what the EU is and how it works. Partnership, as you or I might understand it, is simply not on offer from the EU. Participation of any kind in the EU is structurally prescribed to be integration, not cooperation, and this cannot be stressed often enough. So, thus misguided, the September paper advocated many forms of future structural attachment, notably to the CSDP, the Common Security and Defense Policy missions and operations under the MPCC, the Military Planning and Conduct Capability, which is an ERSAT's EU standing military headquarters. The September 2017 DEXU paper was also the place where the May cells ambition to, I quote, seek to develop a deep and special partnership with the EU that goes beyond existing third party arrangements was first stated to be later repeated crescendo, fortissimo. It proposed to pay into the EU defense pot, to subscribe to EU rules, structures, and agreements. It proposed to stay within the European Defense Agency's projects and initiatives, European defense funding, including both the European Defense Research Program and the European Defense Industrial Development Program. What on earth was going on? Well, that became plain on the 15th of March, 2018. The Sun newspaper published explosive extracts from a secret tape recording of British officials speaking to a group of EU officials. First on the tape, we hear a British official called Victoria Billing from the DEXU, the Department for Exiting the EU, chuckle as she describes how British officials go through the motions of making a chocolate coating superficially conforming to the Brexit mandate, while actually baking a layered biscuit from the sort of integrative agreements listed in the September 2017 paper. And then on the full tapes, uh, which the Sun newspaper kindly released to me, uh, and which are published on our Briefings for Brexit website as an annex to my Hotel California paper, which is there and on the screen here, you will find the references to Google them. We hear Alistair Brockbank from the May Cell making extraordinary statements. He says, quote, where we think things should be, and similar to what the EU has put out in their guidelines, is that there should be no gap on CFSP or CSDP, the Common Security and Defense Policy, on exit day. He regrets our absence from PESCO permanent structure cooperation, the main organ of the defense union. He says that, quote, we would want to see what we can contribute towards PESCO still as the EU moves it forward. And on the list of acronymic EU defense institutions, the EDF, the EDRP, EDIDP, et cetera, et cetera, that I put up on the slide earlier, he states that, quote, forgive the illiteracy, the capabilities side, um, we are interested in it all. He wants to remain in CARD, which is the Coordinated Annual Review of Defense, to which we will return, even talking about the EU retaining a seat on the EU negotiating bodies while aware that only a proximity role might be possible. And he suggests that the EEAS, the ERSAT's foreign ministry, 
should actually have people posted inside British ministries after Brexit. Like Miss Billing, Mr. Brockbank cynically boasts that it is civil servants who are, and I quote, negotiating the detail of that at the same time as we are discussing the political high-level fluffy bits that will go into any declaration that gets made public. In other words, wool to be pulled over the people's eyes. He states that the ambition is to lock the UK into and under EU control in the defense, security, and intelligence areas by international treaty as soon as possible after leaving day. To this day, to my knowledge, he has been neither censured nor sacked. The worst was swiftly confirmed. A murder of crows gathered. On the 24th of May 2018, the government slipped out a dryly named technical note on external relations. Now, it is said, ladies and gentlemen, that the devil is in the detail. And there is indeed a whole pandemonium in here. In Article 6 and 14, we find ambitions to share intelligence and analysis. And this was confirmed the next day in the technical note on exchange and protection of classified information, 25th of May, which shows that the May cell placed intelligence sharing with the EU at the core of its offer to, quote, build a new deep and special relationship with the EU fundamental to cooperation across the future partnership. Affirming this, a cabinet office paper on security on the 28th of November of last year finally conceded that a structural and institutional relationship will be created in this area. And that, thinking of Cortez, is really burning the boats on the beach. It states that, quote, the UK and the EU have agreed to conclude an agreement. Although agreements on classified information exist between the EU and uh, non-associated third countries, such as Canada and the United States, the UK's intention of remaining in the EU's defense industrial structures and associated policies would necessitate a CSDP-based agreement because everything is linked to everything else. So the technical notes claims, clauses 11 and 12, that Canada and the United States are equivalent precedents on which the UK can build but potentially go further is dangerously false. The government acknowledges that this relationship would be more than ad hoc, and it governed by the EU's prescribed security of information agreement for this purpose. And the political declaration even acknowledges that the UK and the EU should, quote, should exchange intelligence in support of CSDP missions and operations to which the United Kingdom will be contributing and which the government has committed to stay in as a precondition to participate in the EU's defense industrial landscape and frameworks. The political declaration, which is part of the withdrawal agreement, they are, by the way, integrally linked. Uh, the political declaration is not voluntary, as is often said, indicates UK interest in the EU satellite center and space projects, all of which are components of the EU's military construct and CSDP, as the SDIP agreements of late 2016 made it so. Yet the EU will exclude the United Kingdom, Europe's principal satellite builder, from access to Galileo's secure signal, while letting us pay for the project if our government is so stupid or so disloyal. Given that unlike Canada or the United States, the UK will be compelled by the exit deals to apply the EU's CSDP, since everything is attached to everything else, the EU global strategy, must be much beloved of Mr. Lapsley, will rule us. This document, calls for a hub-and-spoke intelligence arrangement between the EEAS, the Foreign Service, INTSEN, the Intelligence Center, and National Intelligence Capabilities of CSDP states. And these are structural, not ad hoc relationships. And so it follows that they threaten the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance that is the bedrock of Western security. The government of the United Kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, has to choose between the Anglosphere and the wider world, or structural subordination to military EU. The people of the United Kingdom have chosen the wider world. The officials and the May cell have chosen military EU. This is absolutely the wrong choice. 
And it's therefore an inescapable fact that the Orwellian non-withdrawal agreement documents pose a real and present threat to UK national security in the most fundamental way possible. More crows join the murder. In Article 17 of the External Relations Technical Note, we find ambitions to lock us into subordination with the EU Political and Security Committee and the EU Military Committee, precisely as Brockbank said in the KitKat tapes, because that's what they're called, because if you know what KitKat bars are, that's exactly what Victoria Billings describing. There, in Article 17, subsection F, we find the ambition for, quote, secondments to the EU Foreign Service. In, in 17H, subsection 1, UK participation in the EU operational headquarters. The documents from the 19th of November 2018 European Council place Romaniac minister Alan Duncan in the room when it was agreed to give the MPCC the authority of an executive military headquarters with the legal right to command intervention forces by 2020. It also agreed to formalize CARD, the Coordinated Annual Review of Defense, which sounds innocent, but which allows the EU to exert financial leverage on uses of national defense budgets, and thirdly, to increase funding to the EDP, uh, which was agreed, by the way, on the 18th of April last month, at a level of 13 billion euro, which compels compliance with EU strategic control. All of this with the UK under its power. And yet more crows. Article 18 intends to achieve a bespoke administrative arrangement with the European Defence Agency. It agrees arrangements for participation in the Commission's European Defence Fund, all reconfirmed, by the way, in clause 104 of the political declaration. To have, quote, the option to participate in PESCO as a third party and access to, quote, commercial opportunities. But ladies and gentlemen, we have formally said that we will not be in PESCO. Ministers and civil servants clearly do not understand that third party participation is, as I have said twice already, structurally prescribed to be subordination or nothing. Britain did not vote for a deep and special degree of subordination more than any other third party. We have been here before, as John of Gaunt lamented on his deathbed with uncanny precision. England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. And then we get to the truly devilish part in Article 25. Quote, we should not wait where we do not need to. The UK welcomes the agreement that future arrangements on CSFP and CSDP could become effective during the implementation period. And that is precisely what Brockbank said in the KitKat tapes. And it would effectively mean that any time after, quote unquote, leaving in chains, the government could permanently lock us under EU control in defense and security by prerogative powers. In effect, it would allow for a very English administrative coup d'etat. And the political declaration does this locking in on its own. Ladies and gentlemen, I have deliberately taxed you with acronyms and obscure clauses, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds, for which I apologize. I did it not to bore you, but to scare you with the facts. I did it also to preempt any in this room or elsewhere who would question the facts behind my warning of the real and present danger to Anglo-American security that the May cell has deliberately inscribed into its Hotel California strategy to subvert the will of the British people by these most dangerous of games. Of course, we have published at home the analysis I share with you here today. And battle is truly joined. On the 29th of November 2018, together with two major businessmen, Rocco Forte and Sir Peter Marshall, 
a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Lord Lawson, Lord Trimble, the Nobel Prize winning First Minister, former First Minister of Northern Ireland, and General Julian Thompson, Royal Marines, the commander of the initial landings leading to the liberation of the Falkland Islands in 1982, Sir Richard Dearlove wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister pointing out her complete failure to understand that the vote to leave the EU was not primarily about trade, but about sovereignty, that no risks were greater than the withdrawal agreement's terms of surrender, that the people voted to take back control, not for a colonial status, and that she had broken trust with the British people, just as she had lost the trust of so many of her ministers. The response was immediate, astonishing, and in a perverse way, welcome. Number 10 Downing Street singled out Sir Richard and General Julian for a punishment beating. And for the first time in the history of MI6, saw fit to admonish a former C in public. We read the number 10 rebuttal with relish and proceeded to a full demolition in terms, just as I have done here today. And you can find that document on Briefings for Brexit, our website, where we mark number 10's homework. Then, on the 8th of January 2019, as Mrs. May prepared to present her toxic withdrawal document to Parliament for the first time, in another unprecedented move, Sir Richard combined with Field Marshal the Lord Guthrie, one of our most illustrious post-war chiefs of the defense staff, and they wrote to the chairmen of all conservative constituency associations, advising them to cause their MPs to vote down this quote unquote bad agreement, which quote, threatens to change our national security policy by binding us into new sets of EU controlled relationships. This elicited a second irascible dressing down from Number 10 Downing Street on the 13th of January, to which the Richard and the Field Marshal replied that, quote, this is the second time within a month that Number 10 has issued an inaccurate reprimand of this sort. And once more, the facts had to be rehearsed. After going down to the largest defeat of the democratic era in the House of Commons by 230 votes, the May cells' response with connivance of our rogue speaker and against all convention of Erskine May, the handbook of parliamentary protocol, was like a terminator just blown up by Mr. Schwarzenegger to get up, dust off, and just keep on coming, bringing back the same deal once more. Accordingly, Sir Richard and I wrote to all Conservative and Irish Unionist MPs and all chairmen renewing our warning and advice. But at the same time, with Lord Guthrie, we realized that the positive response was also required. And therefore, the three of us drafted and have published on the 6th of March this year, the text of a defense treaty between the UK and the EU that actually protects the security of the realm and of our natural Anglosphere alliances. And we introduced it to the public in this way. We wrote, the public is not aware that the government has embedded a fatal concession within its withdrawal strategy. We three have combined out of a sense of duty to reveal this to the public and to MPs alike. Government is proposing to compromise the crown jewels of our national security in a futile search for a deal with the EU. And this will compromise our premier intelligence alliance with the Five Eyes. And those denying this are wrong, in fact, as we know, and as our allies agree. Having successfully prevented the EU from developing a defense role for over 40 years, bizarrely, the government's withdrawal agreement and associated documents threatens to place Europe's premier defense and intelligence power under EU control. And this is the reverse of what the people voted for in June 2016, and it is a constitutional outrage. And the fact is also concealed, and so we join up the dots. The government proposes an early defense treaty after we leave the EU, but the terms are, in our view, utterly unacceptable. And therefore, we have drafted a safe and protective treaty which is published on briefings for Brexit. Ladies and gentlemen, rightly it is said that the darkest hour comes often before the dawn. 
It has been my unfortunate duty, but, Ted, great privilege, to warn you here today that US security will not be immune from damage if we fail in this battle for Britain to defeat the strategy of the May cell and to secure a government in our country that will faithfully and cleanly execute the expressed will of the people. Rightly, it is also said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Where better then to sound a fire bell in the night than here, under the auspices of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom? I'm grateful for your patience and your attention. And now we seek, by all the means that this distinguished American audience and those far-flung watching can muster, by all the means that you have your active support in the struggle to protect and to nourish both our bedrock Anglo-American security alliance and the freedom for which the British people, in great part her people, remobilized by a chance to cast a vote that really counts, voted in unprecedented numbers in Margaret Thatcher's land, thereby expressing what Edmund Burke once described with beautiful simplicity as the wisdom of unlettered men. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Prince. Uh, normally, what we do at this point is ask the audience to uh, chip in with some questions, but always uh, the moderator gets the first crack at it, and I'm going to avail myself of that privilege. Normally, I too would ask a question, but on this occasion, I wanted to do something a little bit different, which is to ask you to clarify for a primarily American audience the extent to which the EU's defense efforts are primarily about defense, uh, which is what Americans tend to think when they hear the word defense, versus the extent to which the EU's defense efforts are in fact about a political ambition. I suspect you know precisely what I'm referring to, but let me just sort of explain it briefly to the audience. Uh, I think it's my impression, at least, that when Americans, or many of them, hear the EU talking about defense, they assume that it means something like what we mean when we talk about defense. That is, it means spending additional resources. It means acquiring more effective capabilities. It means developing effective strategy, effective doctrine, effective tactics, effective logistical arrangements. Uh, it means developing uh, an a useful picture of the adversary. It means planning and, and uh, developing contingency plans. This is what we think of when we think of defense. I'm not persuaded this is what the European Union thinks when it talks about defense. Can you talk a little bit about the different meanings of this term in the American, the British context versus the continental one? Thank you, Ted. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, you are, of course, completely correct. <clears throat> uh, you will have gathered part of the answer from the way that I gave you a brief explanation uh, in the course, oh, by the way, you had a last slide. Um, uh, I gave you a brief explanation in the course of the remarks about how the, you know, the European project since the end of the Second World War has engaged the defense issue. It tried to do it right at the very beginning before the um, uh, coal and steel community because it failed and then it tried again and it's tried again several times. Why does it try to do these things? Uh, because it sees this as a means of achieving ever closer union. Everything is devoted to this end. And of course, as the first diagram which I put up without comment, which comes from a paper that's in fact the most heavily downloaded paper that I have written for briefings for Brexit, explaining why the European Union is now uh, within the zone of the risk of its own collapse. The most dangerous, indeed fatal, thing that it did was to introduce the euro, because the euro was introduced to try and force the creation of the political entity that should underlie a common currency. Um, so as with the common currency, so with defense, a fundamental law of history was breached, which is that you do not create either of these things unless you have a legitimate political entity underneath it which commands loyalty.
because people do not go to war and bleed and die for these sorts of apparatuses. So the reason that I had, regretfully, to bombard you with that storm of acronyms and all the rest of the things which I and my colleagues have to waste our time studying uh, is to alert you to the fact that this corridor warfare is conducted in order to achieve a purpose which has actually nothing much to do with a preparation against real enemies in an outside world. That is why I called it a dangerous game and that the United Kingdom's government and its officials should be prepared to play in any way in this game. I find shameful as well as dangerous. In short, the European project has no business in defense security or intelligence at all. These are the purview either of nation states or of alliances of sovereign nations, of which in the European context, we've had a rather successful one for a long time, and it's called NATO. So if I could summarize, defense is politics by other means. Correct. So uh, let me now turn to the audience uh, and ask if there are any questions uh, from either the audience here or the audience online. Uh, my colleague uh, has a microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, simply raise your hand. And as always, uh, please uh, state your question in the form of a question and identify yourself if you have an affiliation. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Cook. I actually used to work at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I work for a group called the Seminar Network now, but um, kind of uh, following um, that question, what impact do you think the requirement for the UK to be involved in the EU elections is gonna have in um, kind of the conversation that we're having today? Is that just, is that more significant than I think the media is playing into, or is it, it's not that big of a deal? Kind of what's your perspective on that? Well, thank you for your question. It's, of course, not on our main uh, special subject today, but I'll certainly, <laughs> I'll certainly offer you a view since it's in all of our minds. Uh, we find ourselves in a surreal situation where almost three years after 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union, not merely have we not left the European Union, but we are actively considering uh, participating in um, the European elections. Uh, all the indications are that these elections will be apocalyptic for uh, certainly the Conservatives and probably the Labour Party. At the moment, the indication is less for the Labour Party, but I wouldn't count on that because the fury in L'Angleterre Profonde, where I live, which is not London, not Oxford, not Cambridge. I'm, I'm a Cambridge Don, but I don't live in Cambridge anymore. I, I'm a farmer. I live in Devon in the countryside, mm -hmm. surrounded by real people. And they are livid. And these are natural Conservatives. And they will not be voting for the Conservative Party. And so the risk that the Conservative Party is running is the risk which the Conservative Party in Canada ran, you may remember, where it went from government to, I think, three MPs? I think it was one. Or was it one? Yes, I think maybe you're right. Or if you want to make the British reference uh, analogy, it is to the fact that in 1906, the Liberal Party had an overwhelming victory at the polls. And then by the time that it was out of power in 1933, it has never returned since. And George Dangerfield, you may remember, wrote a book called The Strange Death of Liberal England. And although it seems incredible, this mismanagement, if mismanagement it is, and as I've indicated to you, I think that there is more method in this madness than madness. I think that it is a deliberate tactic to frustrate the will of the people. But the consequence of this may well be the end of the longest and oldest and most successful political party in modern democratic history. Other questions from the audience? Perhaps I can ask another question. Go ahead. Uh, you, you've uh, alluded to your belief, which I subscribe to entirely, that the point of this is to frustrate the result of the Brexit referendum. But there are a number of ways that you can look at that if that is indeed their aim. One is that uh, Prime Minister May and her supporters genuinely believe in European defense uh, and European security arrangements, as you've set out. Another is that it's a way of sort of proving their loyalty uh, to the EU, that they're not really interested in defense arrangements per se. They're much more interested in the economic arrangements, but they believe they can't get the economic arrangements without getting the security arrangements. 
Or third, they're not much interested in either of these issues. They're interested in solving the supposed problem of Ireland and Northern Ireland and some of the other you know, less high profile issues that have been, have been sort of raised. What's your view on, on why defense and security has been chosen as a pathway for continued quasi-covert membership of the EU? Uh, yes, I think those are the right three choices to pose. Um, and I think it's uh, certainly two and quite a bit number three. Um, so trade. Mm -hmm. is, is, is trade the preeminence? What I think that the May team believed, and I offered you some of the language from the documents, the public documents, which supports this, is that if they offered the European side in the negotiation, um, a, an unprecedented access to the intelligence, structural intelligence capabilities of Europe's only tier one military power and premier intelligence power. Uh, this would have two effects, they hoped. One was that it would show the European side how devoted they were to the European project. So it's a sort of deliberate self-harming um, and in the process, uh, the other side of it is that if you take the view, which uh, as somebody who is half Dutch, I do take, that the European Union does not wish us well, this is not a conversation between friends, as Mrs. May is so kind, kindly um, uh, used to calling it, but that they wish to, because of the incipient collapse of the entire EU project, they wish to administer punishment beating so nobody else will try and follow in this track, then a way to do this is to cause us uh, serious and material damage uh, such that it will break our relationships with the Anglosphere and particularly uh, with this country. That's why I particularly picked up on the local radio broadcast of Monsieur Macron. It's not been widely publicized, largely because I suppose most people don't speak French that much and they don't listen to local <laughs> French radio. Uh, but I do both. And, um, and he said it. So, you know, it, it, as I said, go figure. Y you have got, uh, I think, a quite desperate elite. And it's a self-interested elite because uh, I, 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 when I left Cambridge and joined public service, uh, one of the jobs that I did at the end of the Cold War was working in the office of the Secretary General of NATO um, with the uh, rather wonderful task of helping to bring the uh, enslaved countries of former Soviet bloc into the Western world. So this was the, the Partnership for Peace and eventually countries like Czechoslovakia and so on joining, joining NATO. And it was uh, a, a remarkable thing to watch how the uh, will of people like Mr. Havel, for example. I, gosh, I remember an occasion in, in the Hrad Castle in uh, Prague where uh, I was there as a, as a modest NATO official and uh, to propose the virtues of the Partnership for Peace, actually. And Mr. Havel said, uh, if you offer us, he said, a lady's flower arranging circle, we will join. <laughs> if you offer us membership of the European Union, we will join. But you offer us membership of NATO, see, we will join because we want to come home. We want to come home to Europe. So in circumstances where you have that sort of motivation, <laughs> you can see why um, it, it's, uh, it's entirely positive. What we have here is the opposite. We have the nomenclatura hanging on to power and they're worried about practical things. Do you know the very first thing that was put on the negotiating table when negotiations began in, in the, that January? I mean, you might think it was something lofty, like uh, looking after the rights of EU citizens in Britain or British citizens in, the United, in, um, uh, in Europe. It was neither of those. I'm going for minor. You're right. But it's a particular form of it, Ted. Um, it was that there should be, an, in the withdrawal agreement, and it is, it, it is there, by the way, um, an agreement that any British uh, elected member or official who had worked for the European institutions in any form should, for the rest of their natural lives, be 
immune to British income tax on their total global income. Because the nomenclatura, as you know, has a flat rate tax, which they don't approve of for other people on their uh, salaries there. And they'd like to keep these sorts of benefits. And so this, for those of us who dealt with the other nomenclatura, has a very familiar ring. And the essence of all of this is that we are dealing here with issues of fundamental legitimacy. We have an illegitimate uh, federal experiment because people don't believe in it. And that's the answer to your question, madam. That is why the elections that are about to happen will not only be catastrophic uh, for the domestic reasons in Britain, I think that they're going to be catastrophic across Europe from the point of view of the project. Um, it is also that people do believe strongly in their nations, their families, and their countries. And what you have to do is to find a way to align the politics with what the people want. We have got this terrible disjuncture, and this particular betrayal over defense and security is probably the most egregious manner of showing this dislocation between the British, the British establishment elite, the, the, the Remainer elite, uh, and the will of the people, and it's terribly dangerous. Uh, a fantastic but unfortunately very depressing story. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. I would just add in closing that your comment about punishment beatings for the UK reminds me a little bit of a saying that I will attribute to Dr. Henry Kissinger. My apologies, Dr. Kissinger, if it's not true. But he is reported to have commented at one point that it is not enough that I succeed. All others must fail. Uh, which strikes me as a little bit uh, like the EU's attitude towards the UK at this point. Yes, so thank you very much uh, for your attention today. Thank you very much for our very distinguished speaker for his important, if depressing, remarks. And thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. We're adjourned. Thank you.